On the 22nd of July 1942, Adam Chernyakov was visited by occupying German forces at his office in the Warsaw Ghetto in Nazi-occupied Poland. This was a pivotal day in the story of the Holocaust. It was the day that Adam Chernyakov would be asked to sign the death sentence for ultimately hundreds of thousands of Jews who would be sent to the Treblinka extermination camp. Marcel Reich, the translator of the Judenrat, described the scene. He said there was deathly silence throughout the building during the session. The officials, absolutely terrified, waited for a death sentence for them and their families. The entire building, especially the entrance to the conference room, was manned. The chauffeur of one of the cars of the arriving Gestapo officers set the radio on, and the cheerful sounds of Strauss waltzes accompanied the meeting with mocking stubbornness, painfully making the gathered Jews aware that life goes on and death is meant only for the jury. The very next day, Adam Chernyakov committed suicide by taking cyanide in that very same office. He didn't want to sign that death sentence for the Jewish community of which he was part. However, despite this, the transports to Treblinka began. On a railway platform in the suburbs of the ghetto, people were rounded up. They were taken from their homes, brutally separated from their families. Men, women and children herded together. Many were shot in the process of the transports or died on the way to the Umschlagplatz. Tens of thousands of people were then herded into cattle cars. They were then sent on a terrible journey with no food and very little water to a small village of Treblinka where a train station already existed. Many caught glimpses of the Polish countryside during this journey and ultimately a glimpse of the railway sign, the only indication of where they were. Some of them knew the name Treblinka because a labour camp had been built there in 1941. And many Polish Jews had been sent to this site to undertake construction works for the German war effort. Many believed that this transport offered them the possibility of going to work in the East. This was a lie that the Nazis told the jury all over occupied Poland as a way of controlling them and transporting them ultimately to their deaths. These transports were incredibly brutal. And when people arrived at Treblinka, the reality, of course, was very different than the lie that they had been told. However, the Nazis tried their very best through the whole process to deceive people. And so when they arrived at Treblinka at the extermination camp, what they saw were railway signs pointing to Białystok in the east. They saw a fake railway station. They saw a, a ticketing office where they were told that they could hand over their belongings while they went to the showers. People were quickly removed from the trains, herded, men separated from women and children, lined up on the platform. A few of the men were selected to go to work in the nearby Treblinka labour camp. However, the vast majority didn't survive. Treblinka extermination camp ultimately saw between 10 to 12,000 people a day murdered. Many of the people who were too ill to walk to the gas chambers were taken to a, a fake field hospital. They were shot, they were into ever, an ever burning pit. Here, the elderly in particular and children were killed, all under a red cross, giving the illusion that somehow they were being taken into some form of care by the Germans. The reality, of course, being the exact opposite. For those who were then made to make the journey to the death, the death camp area into the gas chambers, they were then taken into a building, they had their belongings taken from them. The Germans used these objects. They commodified the Jewish community and, and, the, and their personal belongings. They took their hair, which was then used to stuff mattresses and to make furniture back in, in the Third Reich in Germany. They took their belongings. Many of them were sold. Many of them were traded or taken by the German guards. And they had a whole group of Jews who were forced to sort these belongings on the railway platform area, discarding those seen as not valuable, keeping those that could be of some value to either the German population um, or the SS themselves. Then the people who, were, who had had their belongings taken from them were marched along an avenue called the Himmelstrasse, cruelly called the road to heaven. The pine branches that defined this area of occupied Poland were used to camouflage the view so that the people couldn't see where they were going. They couldn't see that they were being marched to their deaths. Firstly, to a small building known as the old gas chambers if they arrived in the first few months of the camp's existence. 
or to the larger newer gas chambers um, a few months later when the operations at the camp increased. The Centre of Archaeology at Staffordshire University has undertaken a comprehensive survey at Treblinka, the first of its kind since the Second World War. And as part of this research, we've seen the harrowing evidence that survives in the landscape at this camp. That evidence has been overlooked for decades and we were fortunate enough to be able to survey the site and to carry out some small scale excavations, which enabled us to see the traces of these people who were sent to the gas chambers and the remnants of the gas chambers themselves. Starting on that fateful day, the, second, the 22nd of July, 1942, when those first transports began, the Nazis sowed the seed of deception. They tried to hide these crimes, as I've already mentioned, and they built it into the physical fabric of the camp so that the world wouldn't know exactly what was happening at Treblinka. And so this is why our archaeological investigations were so important in order to uncover that vital evidence. That evidence showed us that when people arrived in the gas chambers at Treblinka, they saw uh, brick-built buildings, the only brick buildings in the camp, the only buildings intended to be permanent because extermination was the permanent reality of Treblinka. We excavated, we took off the, the first layers of the soil and very quickly we began to see the personal belongings of the victims who'd been taken into the camp. We uncovered brooches, pendants that were retained by people. They should have had them taken away from them by the Germans when they arrived at the camp, but many people clung on to these belongings hoping that they were going to go on to have, a, have another life in the East, that they were going to work, hoping that they had a small chance of survival. Or perhaps for those who knew what fate awaited them, clinging on to those objects because they reminded them of family members, they had sentimental value, or it was their last attempt to cling on to their humanity, which the Germans cruelly took from them. The people who were sent to the gas chambers had had their hair cut, and traditional historical narratives of Treblinka suggested that this happened on the railway platform. But our archaeological evidence demonstrated that sometimes this hair cutting took place in the gas chamber building itself when the camp was operating to full capacity. So keen were the Germans to eradicate the entire population, the European Jewish population, they actually sent too many transports to Treblinka, more killings than they can manage. And the camp, which was supposedly designed to be industrialised, actually ended up being quite chaotic at times. And therefore the hair cutting had to take place in the gas chambers and on the railway platforms, sometimes simultaneously, so that they could, in their words, process the large number of victims they intended to kill. Therefore, during our archaeological investigations, we came across hair clips, we came across cutting tools such as scissors that were used to remove the hair of the people who were sent to the gas chambers. And so the archaeological investigations gave us an insight that historical sources didn't always tell us into what life was like in those final moments for the people who were sent there. And so ultimately this process of going from the, the reception camp area, from leaving the trains to the gas chambers, usually took around 15 minutes for the men and 20, women, 20 minutes for the women because they had to have their hair cut. Once inside the gas chambers, um, we, our archaeological evidence demonstrated and supported witness testimony that showed that the Germans actually modelled the gas chambers on a bathhouse. They used terracotta tiles, some were orange, some were yellow, to line the floors uh, of, the, of the gas chambers. And these tiles um, are very similar to ones found in Jewish ritual baths elsewhere in occupied Poland. So we don't know for certain that this was a deliberate decision to use these tiles, but we think that this was part of this plan for deception, to make people think that they were entering into some sort of bathhouse and, and, and mocking, in a, in a way, the Jewish community by modelling it on a Jewish ritual bath, when the reality was, of course, people were going to their deaths. In the gas chambers, people were sealed in to those, those structures um, and they were, they were murdered in the most horrific of ways. There aren't, of course, many witnesses to these events, but those who saw it talk about the screams of the people who perished there. And then the Jews who were kept alive in the camp then had to take out the bodies from the gas chamber, firstly burying them in mass graves and later putting them on purpose-made cremation pyres to try and hide the traces of the victims and destroy the bodies of the Jews altogether. 
And again, our archaeological work has aimed to locate the areas in which these graves were situated. And using a wide range of non-invasive methods, uh, which allow us to do so without disturbing the ground, we've pinpointed the area where many of these mass graves existed. And this was vitally important because in Jewish law, it's forbidden to disturb human remains that have been buried in a grave, even of those people who were brutally murdered. And therefore, our archaeological approach was designed to respect the memory at all times of the victims, whilst also simultaneously allowing families a place to go and mourn, an area that they can see and know were, contained the remains of their loved ones. Ultimately, Treblinka was designed as a killing machine. It was camouflaged from view. However, these cremations, of course, were, were um, smelt and seen by members of the surrounding communities. We have many testimonies that talk about what happened at Treblinka. And ultimately, even the Allies knew about the crimes that took place there. And this is uh, one of the harsh realities of coming to terms with Holocaust history, that in many ways that nobody stepped up and did anything about the crimes at Treblinka. No one was so bold as Adam Chiniakov was on that fateful day of the 23rd of July 1942 when he took his own life in protest at the killing of the European jury. And so Treblinka functioned as a killing machine and until ultimately the summer of 1943. And on the 2nd of August 1943, the inmates in that camp staged a revolt and the men within the camp were able to steal arms, to steal weapons, and they rose up against their German overseers. Of course, very few survived, but this day will go down in history of a, of a cru as a crucial day in the history of resistance during the Holocaust. Ultimately, the camp was damaged during this revolt, and the Germans had already begun to wind down the killing operations. Therefore, slowly in the months that followed, the gas chambers were removed, they were deconstructed, the bricks taken away to build other buildings in the vicinity. One of those buildings was a farmhouse at uh, the site of the former camp bakery and dairy. This farmhouse was part of this deception again, this idea that, that the camp had been nothing but a labour camp. And a Ukrainian was stationed there with his family in order to guard the area, which was then subsequently levelled. Therefore, when people passed through the fields of Treblinka, they were told that nothing had happened here, that, that there were no crimes to be found. And it acted as a deterrent for people going and investigating the area. And it wasn't until much later um, in 1944, in August 1944, when the Red Army moved through the area, that the terrible crimes at Treblinka began to be revealed to the world. And the Red Army carried out their own investigations, shortly followed by the Polish government, and they were able to document the terrible atrocities that had happened there. However, the Nazis' attempts to hide the traces of their crimes, to level the camp, to build the farmhouse, to uh, cremate the bodies of the victims who were killed there, were incredibly successful. Because those investigators, although they did find some evidence of the atrocities, they didn't find standing buildings, as happened in other places like Auschwitz. They didn't find many mass graves in the terrain, with the exception of in the area of the nearby labour camp. And therefore, they believed firmly that the SS had been successful in destroying all traces of their crimes. And it would be another 70 years before forensic archaeologists would come along with new technologies and new tools and find new ways to uncover that evidence. And I firmly believe that that kind of investigation is necessary. I firmly believe that, that acts of, of um, advocacy like this are so important because even though many decades have passed since the Holocaust, we need to understand these crimes. We need to document the physical evidence. We need to showcase it to the world in order to combat Holocaust denial, which is on the rise. There have been many recent studies which have shown shocking statistics about how little people in Britain, in the United States, and many other countries around the world know about the Holocaust. Some people don't even know what the Holocaust was. So it's our role as, as educators, as forensic archeologists, and, and just as, as citizens to tell the story of what happened to those people who were sent to Treblinka. And on this day, Holocaust Memorial Day, the theme is one day. And as I've mentioned, I've a number of important days in the history of the Holocaust 
in the last um, 10 minutes that I've, I've been speaking. That day when the Germans arrived to start the transports, the day when Adam Cherniakov took his own life, the days in between when uh, all of those people were, were cruelly ripped from their families, ripped from their lives and had their futures destroyed. And ultimately the day when the Germans decided to hide the traces of their crimes following that important revolt by the citizens of Treblinka. And I think therefore it's very important to say on the Holocaust Memorial Day to use this as, as hopefully not just one day but, but the beginning of a process um, for all of you watching this, for all of us to stand together to commemorate the crimes of the Holocaust and to think about what we can do today and every day in the future to remember those people that we've lost, to remember the families that were torn apart, to remember those people who never went on to have the futures that they dreamt of and also to remember the loss and the, and the gap that is left in society today and the hatred that it, it subsequently spurred, spurred that still exists within our own society. So we need to think about what we can do and we need to remember. And so I would like to dedicate all of the work that, that I've done at Treblinka to the memory of those who perished at Treblinka and during the Holocaust and also to those who perished at other genocides. And I would like to continue my pledge to remember those, those victims. And I hope that, as I say, that you will all stand up and do the same. Bells and Silence by Ilo Lewis. This poem was written by Ilo Lewis, who served in the British 11th Armoured Division, which liberated the bergen belsen concentration camp in April 1945. Long gone the sound of battle from this foreign dell, as we tread again the Belsen grass, Remembering comrades, young men all, who died to reach this awful hell, hallowed now for eternity, as the clouds from memory swiftly pass. Listen then, can't you hear? The silence here around. Tell us of terror and ancient bestial fear. How real is this silence that permeates from underground only 50 years ago, but now forever the silence condemns. From here, there, there lie, anonymous neath the soil, as we reverently bow. Remnants of a living dead, whose silence still transmits, transcends. Listen to the silence still, and lift your head on high. Are you waiting for a question, or an answer, and a void to fill? Quick then, the pulse breathe deeper still. Answer the silence to question why. A friend of mine recently um, made a comment on a Facebook post. You know the ones that say, um, you know, on your birthday what did you do you know they're fishing for something those ones well this was one about um uh, old-fashioned names i try and keep away from them because whenever i put something on there i'll get about 10 marriage proposals in the next hour from strange sounding people in far off places and there were, anyway people were posting on there and they were putting things like mabel alfred gladys gertrude old names and my friend who's a rabbi he posted on Adam, the oldest name. He was referring, of course, to Genesis and the poem about creation when God created the first person and named him Adam. I suggested that he looked a bit closer because that wasn't the first name that was given. The first name that was given in that account was given to the light when God created the light and he called the light Day. The first thing God ever named was the day, and he called it day. <laughs> days are, well, day is an important concept to us, isn't it? It's how we mark where we are in the world and in our life today, yesterday, another day. Um, 24 hours, uh, a revolution of the earth around the sun, it's... Um, it's a science thing, a day. Days are important. But I think there's a way in which a day is a more philosophical thing. A day is a deeper thing than just accumulation of minutes and seconds and hours. A day can have a whole other deeper meaning. So you can look forward to a day looking forward with hope a day can be an optimistic thing um, one day 
Wolves will win the Premiership one day. It's a phrase we in Wolverhampton use all the time. Someday it will be my day. Someday my numbers will come up on the lottery. Someday in the future. We don't know when it is. It's something we hope for. We hope for the day when it will be my day. It's a, it's a future optimistic event. That day. Um, that idea of a day um, has been used throughout history for people often who found themselves in captivity, uh, in slavery, uh, in a real tough spot. They look forward and they hope for the day of reckoning, the day of justice, the day of liberation. One day all will be well. It's a future event, that day. Very important concept. It's not talking about 24 hours, it's talking about a whole other thing, that special day, it's an event. We also use the word day and the concept of a day to look back, don't we, to a golden era. You should have seen him in his day. When I was in my day, you wouldn't have got close. Back in the day, so the day, we have our day, don't we? We don't know when it was. We don't know when it was that we had our day, when we were in our day. It's a, it's, a, it's a time that we can't put our finger on when it was, but we kind of think we've, we've all had one, haven't we, when we were in our day, and we use it of other people back in the day, when they were, should have seen them in their day. So there's something golden era-ish about it looking back. There's something hopeful about that day looking forward. Days, we mark days, we mark anniversaries and quite rightly so, so we'll mark our birthdays, we might mark our wedding anniversary, we might mark when our children were born or grandchildren were born. Um, we mark certain days uh, and that's very important, special calendar events. Um, but then there are other days that, um, that perhaps have a meaning on a whole other level. That day, when, that day when you decided to say no to something, life-changing day. That day when you decided to say yes to something and your life was never the same ever again. That day when you decided to say enough's enough. That day when you said no more. That day when you stopped something. That day when you started something and your life was never the same again. We have, some of us, those days as well. They're, they're the days that fashion us and make us the people we are. Very important days. But they're more than just the 24 hour thing. They're really, really significant. They make us human. They make us who we are. They become part of our history. And then there are days when we think nothing really quite happened today. However, are we really sure that nothing happened today? I was taken by listening to all the tributes given to the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Um, and I remember uh, listening to an interview that they played of him where he mentioned when he was a young boy walking down the street in South Africa, with his mother back in the, in the dark days of apartheid. And as he was walking down the street, as was the custom back then, um, tragically so, if a white person was walking on the path towards you, as a black person, you had to get off the path and walk into the road. And Archbishop Tutu remembers walking down the road as a boy with his mom and walking the other way was an Anglican priest. And their eyes kind of connected and the Anglican priest got off the path and walked in the road. So Archbishop Tutu, then a child, with his mom, didn't have to. They walked on the path. And Desmond Tutu recalls that day. He said, that day was life transforming for me. Um, 
it made, he said, it made me think of the faith of that clergyman. What was it that made him do such a thing to be generous when he didn't have to be? That's what made Desmond Tutu a Christian. He went on to be an archbishop and a great leader um, and campaigner for apartheid. He said, when it fell, when apartheid crumbled, there was a chance South Africa could have gone one of two ways. It could have gone through a peaceful truth and reconciliation path or a bloodbath, a day of reckoning. And with the Archbishop's guidance and faith and influence, they went through the truth and reconciliation process. And he, and he says, because I learned how to be generous when I didn't have to be. He held all the cards now as a black man in South Africa. He called the shots and he decided, let's be generous even when I don't have to be, just like that clergyman was. That clergyman's probably got no idea what he did. For that clergyman, it was probably just an ordinary day. It might have been a Wednesday that he was hoping to get the rid of because he was looking forward to his day off on Friday or something like that. Who knows how important each day is? To us and to other people. So I'm going to finish with this. Days are important. Seize the day, they say, don't they? Carpe diem. Seize the day. Seize every day. Mark your anniversaries. Don't be blase about them. They really matter. Have a Prosecco. Get your feet up. Reflect when it's your birthday on where you've been and all your friends and your family and eat your cake. Definitely mark days and anniversaries. But also, don't wish away, oh, you know, oh, it's Monday, I can't wait till Friday and I break up. Oh, it's Tuesday, wishing away Tuesday and Wednesday. I used to do that when I started working in the factories. Um, it was, I, I would just try and, try and get through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Fridays were okay because we got paid. And you wish most of your life away. Each day can matter. Each day can have significance. Maybe you're in your day as we speak and you just don't know it yet. So make it a good one.